Today we are getting all up in those dirty, nasty, technical issues that the team faced while making this episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I'm reading you some of the bumps that aired back in 2004, right before Unremarkable Voyage premiered. And also, I'm telling you all about how friends ripped off Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Damn it, Ross. Let's see you try and pivot out of that one. All right. All of that and more on today's episode of Dancing is Forbidden. Meet Wad. Get that jam box going. This is a good beat. How to dance them? Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. You who running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode, one episode at a time. And the episode we are watching through and talking about this week is Season 3, Episode 2, Unremarkable Voyage. Tell me you didn't just eat that hey, freaking- boy, you saw as a chip. So where's the dip? Or am I looking at him? You did not even just do that! Unremarkable Voyage premiered May 9th, 2004, so we are two weeks out from Video Ouija, the last episode we covered. And this is one that I have seen, but besides a couple moments in it, this is really the first episode of Aqua Teen that we are diving into here that I am not intimately familiar with, that I have not seen a ton of times and have really great memories of. So I'm actually excited to dive into this one. Of course, I have seen it. I, I do know some of the key moments, for example, Carl's very large and impressive penis size towards the end. But otherwise, don't have a whole lot to say about this one. And I, I want to keep it that way. I, I kind of want to see how this goes diving into this one that I am not super familiar with. So of course, before we dive into it, got to you about a little poll I did over on the Instagram and Twitter. Of course, at Aquatine Pod on both. If you want to follow along, check the link in the show notes. It's there for you. So over there, I asked, which game would you rather play? Video Ouija or Insult Master? And the votes were very similar on both. So I'll just read you the Instagram results. We had 38% for Video Ouija and 62% for Insult Master. And again, the Twitter results were very, very similar. So very surprising here for me because Video Ouija, you can actually talk to the dead. The episode demonstrates this, that it actually works. Yet people want to play a game where you just insult the computer. You can insult people in real life for free. No one's stopping you. It's not illegal. Go insult somebody right now. Meanwhile, if you want to talk to the dead, it ain't so easy. So very surprised here. Seems like a lot of people, they have a real mean streak inside of them. They're just dying to let out. Of course, thank you everybody who votes in those polls. It's always so fun to see the results, even if they are shocking to me and are against my expectations. The second thing is I want to give a thank you to Shinsuke over on Twitter. This is at Carol Crowbot for designing a little uh, little version of, of me. It's supposed to be me as a, a tater tot. That is my Aqua Teen persona. I've got a little Dancing is Forbidden hat on. Looks pretty slick. I should make those hats, actually. And uh, I got my little blow-up Meatwad beach ball next to me, the one that you can see in my Season 2 episode ranking video. And fun fact for you, uh, Dave Willis gave me that, that blow-up ball, so maybe I'll talk about that one of these days. Really, really cool drawing. I, I really like to see that kind of stuff. Thank you, Shinsuke. Of course, link to that in the show notes. All right, that's that. Hey, what do you say we go ahead here? We see what in the world was going on the week that Unremarkable Voyage premiered. Some say he's a holy man. Others say he's a murderer. I think everyone can say and agree that the week of May 9th, 2004, he is also at the top of the box office. We have Van Helsing bringing in over $51 million. And in case you're unfamiliar, Van Helsing, it's all about Hugh Jackman. He's killing all sorts of creepy critters like vampires and, and zombies and all sorts of scary kind of things. I mean, this isn't a horror podcast. I hope I haven't scared you too much with this information. But Van Helsing here, again, that's 51 mil in its first week, I should mention. And this is really the first big box office film in quite a while. So, of course, in our last podcast episode, we talked about Man on Fire. That one only brought in 22 mil in its first week. Uh, in between here, we have a cool movie. In case you're, you're still scared, you're still shivering, this one might cheer you up a little bit. We had Mean Girls at the top of the box office on May 2nd, 
bring in 24 mil. But yeah, everything before this is around the 20 million mark up until Passion of the Christ debuted at the end of February of 2004. So Van Helsing, the first real big box office kind of uh, hit, I guess you could say, in a little bit here. And a little bit of trivia here for Van Helsing. It actually broke interview with the Vampire's record of $36.3 million for the highest weekend debut for a vampire film. So Van Helsing, hey, not only is he getting Kate Beckinsale, but he's also getting all the accolades when it comes to vampire-related films. You know, if you watch that film, if you look really closely at the 37-minute mark, you can actually see Moth Monster Man uh, in, in the school bus there. And Van Helsing, uh, he, he shoots the school bus. So it's really cool cameo there by Aqua Teen Hunger Force. And if you're wondering if anybody who was in Aqua Teen Hunger Force was also in Van Helsing, if there is any shared cast or crew between the two, I'm here to stab that stake right in your little heart and tell you, hell no, nobody that worked on Aqua Teen was in Van Helsing. I guess Van Helsing, he, he could fight off all the creepy critters, all the werewolves and, and other nefarious creatures, but he could not fight off the bad ratings because it only has a 6 out of 10 on IMDb and a 24% on Rotten Tomatoes. And before we move on to music, we actually have a very big sitcom ending on the 6th. So three days before this episode of Aqua Team premieres, we have Friends. That's right, it's ending its run after 10 years. Monica, Chandler, Ross, Rachel, Phoebe, Joey, pack it up. Get out of that fountain. Your show is over. You gotta dry off. You gotta get out of there. Joey, don't don't move too quickly because Joey, he's about to get his own sitcom the following season, but nobody really cares about that show. So we have Friends premiering uh, their episode, which is very, very unoriginally titled The Last One. They are airing that on the 6th. And how Matt and Dave have not sued these guys, I do not know. I, I, sh I should ask Dave about that next time I talk to him. Say, Dave, what are you doing? You have a multi-million dollar lawsuit on your hands. Aqua Teen premiered the last one five months previous to this. Come on now. I mean, with the budget that Friends has, they really have to steal from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. This is so sad. Friends, of course, a show that everyone likes to shit on. I'm constantly seeing posts online about how it's just not funny, and I call bullshit on that. I think Friends is a funny show. It's not my favorite show of all time, but if it's on, I'll sit there and watch it and, and laugh a decent amount throughout it. I think it's all right. And uh, my favorite episode of Friends would be the episode where uh, Ross, he, he gets his keyboard from college out, and turns out he's like a musician, but he makes these like soundscapes with like like all the weird sounds that you get on a keyboard, like dogs barking and stuff. Very funny. I, I think that's like one of the top five times, like the hardest I've ever laughed. I was fucking crying watching that for the first time. Again, I'm a musician. I've talked about that to death on the show about how music jokes always hit me really hard. And that was definitely a case of that. But if you're somebody that just doesn't like Friends, look, I get it. It's not the best show of all time. And I, I'm not, I guess I'm not going to sit here and defend it, right? Well, I don't have any skin in this game. They're all doing fine. They're all millionaires. They don't need my help defending them. So moving on here to music. I warned you. I told you this was coming up. So don't act surprised. Our top album this week is Confessions by Usher. And our top track this week is Yeah by Usher as well. But we do have a new top alternative track this week. Let's give it a listen. That is Jet with their song Cold Hard Bitch topping the alternative Billboard charts this week. And I've told this story before, but when I was in middle school, I was in a band with this guy who ended up getting a BC Rich Warlock guitar, which is one of those like spiky metal guitars. But Jet was his favorite band. Like this was the song that he was playing on that spiky black evil looking guitar. Very funny to me. But Jet, I guess an Australian band, I had not noticed that. And yeah, this song really just the tone of the song takes me back to that time particularly with this song specifically, but also I think it kind of influenced songs to come in the, the coming few years. So I'm interested to follow that along on the podcast because 2004 was a little bit before my like coming of age time. But, you know, in 2006 and such, a lot of music really did sound like this. And again, it just really takes me back. So catchy song. The song's honestly better than I remembered it being. And it's still one that you're probably hearing today. Like if you're at a concert and they're uh, changing the stage. This, this would be a popular one to come on. 
And Jet, I think they might be fans of Usher because check out the beginning of the song. Yeah! All right, moving on here. We've talked about our film and television. We've talked about our music. You know that leaves one thing. We got some video games to talk about. First up, two days after Video Ouija came out, we had a little game called City of Heroes coming out. And City of Heroes is an MMORPG, but it was superhero themed. And I never played this game growing up, but I had friends that did. And there was also like a DLC or something called City of Villains, where you could play as a villain, and then you would like fight the heroes and and stuff like that. And I always wanted to play it, but I, I was never able to. But my understanding of this game is that there is a lot of like customization in your character. In terms of MMORPGs, very few games, even to this day, even almost 20 years later, barely come close to how you could customize your character in this game. But sadly, it was shut down in 2012. However, in 2019, source code was released, and now people are making their own private servers for City of Heroes. I don't think you even have to pay to play it. And this is definitely something I need to check out at some point just to kind of, you know, experience something that I wasn't able to at the time. But I've watched a few videos on this game back, like, years ago, and so I have something of an understanding of it. And it seems like a decent game, and it seems like it was always well-received. And again, like, in 2023 now, there are servers you can play on that are fan-hosted that I think fix a lot of the issues with the game. And I think it still has a healthy community of people playing it. So that is really cool. I always love to hear these kinds of stories. That is City of Heroes. I'm almost tempted just to start playing it and make a character called the Drizzle and make him look as close to the Drizzle as possible and kick some fucking ass. Anyways, five days before this episode of Aqua Team premieres, we also have another game coming out, and this game is one that I didn't even know about. This is a game called Red Dead Revolver. And of course, we are now familiar with Red Dead Redemption, the cowboy game. You know, Kid Rock said it best, I want to be a cowboy baby. Well, in Red Dead Redemption, you can, but before that, in 2004, they released Red Dead Revolver. And by they, I mean Rockstar Games. And this is not super similar to Red Dead Redemption, to my knowledge. This is more kind of a typical game, like there's like different stages. And then also, it's much shorter. Like the video I was watching of this game is like, The guy beats it in around two hours, while Red Dead Redemption is one of those huge open world games that you would expect from Rockstar that takes you, you know, months of your life to beat or or whatever it is. Uh, Yeah, Red Dead Revolver came out that I guess was critically kind of panned. Like, at the time, it was considered all right, but it wasn't necessarily like a horrible bad game. Of course, Red Dead Redemption, my understanding is leagues, leagues, and leagues better than Red Dead Revolver. But that did come out here just a few days before Unremarkable Voyage aired. And of course, kind of uh, laid the groundwork for Red Dead Redemption that came out in 2010, I think. Very, very popular game. But yes, that all starts on May 4th, just five days before Unremarkable Voyage premieres. So, all right, it's Sunday night, May 9th, 2004. You're in an existential crisis. It's been the worst three days of your life. Your favorite show, Friends, got canceled. You're so upset about it. You've been listening to Jet's cold hard bitch on repeat, just thinking, you know, you're aiming that bitch at the network that ended your favorite show of all time, and now you're logging on to City of Heroes. You made your character the Friends Revenger, and you are killing whoever took Friends off the air. You are just taking it out. Well, eventually, uh, your mom comes in, she kicks you off the computer, she says, this is not a healthy attachment to the show Friends. You should not be acting this way, this is not normal. So, unfortunately, you're kicked off the computer, you flick on the tube, you're like, well, shit, I guess I'll watch something here. You go onto this weird channel, what is this, Adult Swim? I never see, this is normally Cartoon Network, what the fuck is this? You click on Adult Swim, it's 11 o'clock at night. What's coming on tonight? Well, I should say, first of all, we are still in our Popeye's 75th anniversary celebration. They are going all out on this Popeye thing. I don't really understand it, but let's jump into it here. At 11 p.m., we have Futurama with Bender Gets Made. This is the 2000 episode where Bender, he kind of gets involved with the, with the mafia. It's a good time. Really like this episode. After that, 11.30, we have Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law with SPF, which is a new episode and is our only other new episode of the night besides our Aqua Teen episode. The synopsis on this one is Harvey becomes addicted to fake tanning during a case representing Ding-a-Ling Wolf. That to me sounds almost like it could be a space ghost plot, but uh, yeah, that's our uh, new 
Harvey Birdman for the night. Again, Harvey Birdman's still only in season two. This is season two, episode five. As I've said so many times, Harvey Birdman just lagging behind the other shows that kind of debuted with Adult Swim because Aqua Teen, we're in our third season now after a second season of 24 episodes and a first season of 18 episodes. Harvey Birdman just uh, taking its time here. But this one, the ratings on it are good. I mean, it seems like they're slower to come out with new Harvey Birdman, but uh, they're you know highly rated, so I can't be mad about that. Plus, I should say Harvey Birdman, much more animated than anything else on Adult Swim at this point, which leads to why it takes so long to make them. Uh, moving on from there, 11.45, we get C-Lab 2021 with Brain Switch, which is not a new episode. Midnight now, again, technically Monday morning. We have Aqua Teen with Unremarkable Voyage, the episode we are talking about today. After that, we get a throwback. At 12.15, we get Aqua Teen again with Rabot. So, uh, you know, kind of uh, cool to see that here. The newest Aqua Teen episode alongside the oldest Aqua Teen episode. From there, we get 12.30 with The Ripping Friends, Jimmy's Kidnapped, a show that I continue to not care about. At 1 a.m., we get The Oblongs with Bucket Heads. You know how much I love The Oblongs. After that, at 1.30 a.m., we get The Popeye Show, and this one's just called Show Number 14. Again, it's just a mashup of old Popeye cartoons with a narrator also named bill murray he is uh just giving information and telling stuff about popeye so that is our lineup tonight same as our lineup last week we have futurama harvey birdman c lab two aqua teens the ripping friends the oblongs and the popeye show before we head out of this segment i got two little things i want to tell you about first of all is that on weeknights aqua teen is showing twice on weeknights as well so you know if you're an aqua teen fan at this time you're getting basically two aqua teen episodes every night which is fantastic Except I should say on Saturdays, because that, of course, is anime night. But the other thing I wanted to tell you is that I, I didn't mention this at the time. I should have mentioned this in last week's episode. And thanks to Carson for pointing this out over on the Discord. Is that technically, Space Goes Coast to Coast, as we know it, had ended at this point. You know, I mentioned home movies ending. Well, also, we have Space Ghost ending as well. Of course, Space Ghost does come back on, like, web episodes and stuff. It's kind of weird. Space Ghost will come back in a way. And, you know, you have you have uh, George Lowe dressing up as Space Ghost for certain things. For example, on the colon movie film special features. Like, that character isn't completely gone at this point. But uh, Space Ghost, as we know it on Adult Swim, has technically ended. I should have mentioned that, but I didn't know. I didn't know if I wanted to because, again, he does come back on some webisodes. But yeah, I, sh I should just mention it here. So thanks, Carson, for reminding me about that. So all right, we are sufficiently set up for Unremarkable Voyage. Let's go talk about it. Let's go check it out. No little ad this week, just coming in to let you know about an upcoming schedule change on the podcast. Basically, every last Monday of the month will just be a Patreon episode with a preview here on the free feed. I don't know how long this will last, but I kind of want to try it out and see how it goes. This is kind of a twofold decision. So the first point being that between making all the content for the podcast, I just haven't had time to really promote it in the way that I wanted to. So hopefully this frees up a little time to do that. And the second point is I just want the Patreon content to be better. So if you would like to see normal episodes come back every single week, then the best thing you could do honestly is, is share the show, uh, show somebody the show. If you have any Aqua Teen friends that, that like Aqua Teen, you think they'd like the podcast, let them know about it. Otherwise, if you want access to that last episode every month, then head over to patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden and sign up at the $5 and up tier. You will get a custom RSS feed that you can plug into your podcast app of choice and listen that way. We've actually got a lot of stuff coming up on the Patreon. So we are going to be diving through all the volume three promo spots. There's 11 of them. So I'm really excited because it's all new Aqua Teen content. Also, the number one in the Hood G tier patrons will be voting on which other Adult Swim show that I should cover that aired the same night of the Moon and Night episode Remooned, which we will be covering in February. And lastly, big news here, the man himself, Matt Malero, gave me the A-OK -okay to upload some video segments from my interview with him because there's a lot of visual elements to it. He was kind of showing me his guitars, some of his artwork, all sorts of stuff. So I'm really excited to, to get that out there and let other Aqua Teen fans see it as well. So again, that is over on the Patreon. Check the link in the show notes. And as for how long this schedule change will last, I'm not really sure. We'll just see. Hopefully I can get things back to being in a good spot. 
up next, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Unremarkable Voyage premiering May 9th, 2004 with a TV 14 DV rating for suggestive dialogue and violence. And that is not a surprise here. I mean, you've seen the episode. You know exactly what goes on here. And uh, kind of to get into spoiler territory, this might be the most graphic episode of the show yet. I mean, give me some time to think on it. But off the top of my head, I think that might be the case. And that kind of, you know, is a marker of, of where the show will continue to go. But the name on this one, a throwback to the film Fantastic Voyage, which came out in 1966, and it's a sci-fi film basically about a group of scientists who get shrunk down in a submarine, they get inserted into a scientist, they have to fix his brain, they gotta get tiny, get in there and do some work. And I watched the trailer for this, and the effects on it are really good. They really hold up. I think that speaks to the power of practical effects that, uh, you know, 60 years later, they're still looking pretty decent. And the film was actually based on a story, but... While they were making the film, they got kind of the rights to the to the novelization, and then they approached Isaac Asimov, the, the famous sci-fi writer, to write a book based on the story of Fantastic Voyage. But the interesting thing is that the book came out before the film was done, so a lot of people thought that Fantastic Voyage was based on the Asimov book, but that's not the case. It, it was based on, like, a short story, but, uh, yeah, it was not based on that book. So that is Fantastic Voyage. I have to imagine... It was Matt kind of uh, drawing inspiration from this, given that he is kind of like a sci-fi horror buff. But who knows? I mean, it's a pretty big film. So, you know, Dave could have seen it, too, and been inspired by that. But I also recall a Magic School Bus episode where it's very similar. They go inside one of the kids' bodies. And to me, that's weird. I'm like, I would not want my class swimming around in my body there. But that's what happens over on Magic School Bus. For some reason over on the Aqua Teen Hunger Force fandom wiki, Matt Harrigan is listed as a writer on this one. However, he's not actually in the credits, so I have no clue where they're pulling that from. I can't find any evidence that Matt Harrigan contributed here, uh, but who, who knows where that's coming from. So, on to our voice cast here. It's just our typical voice cast. Gary Means, Dana Snyder, Dave Willis. There are no new characters in this episode. And of course, we have our Space Kataz opening with our typical voice actors there. But again, we are not covering these in these episodes. If you're listening from the future, if you're some sort of time traveler, then check the Patreon. Our coverage of the full Space Kataz will be up then. But if you're a lowly present peasant like myself, then it's not up yet. So, all right, jumping into our episode, we open it on Frylock. He is in the living room giving some sort of presentation to Meatwad and Shake. And he has a whiteboard up on the wall, kind of by the kitchen uh, near the hallway. On the whiteboard, we can see what is supposed to be a microchip, like a drawing of one. And then it goes in and shows some sort of like atom with like the electrons and everything. And he's explaining how it's an issue that you run into limitations with with building these microchips because you're trying to pack so much into it but you're limited by the size and basically all of this is a way for him to explain that he's made a shrink ray so that he can shrink down these large complex computer chips and then they'll be tiny and then they can fit them into smaller things and eventually we see Meatwad and Shake and they're just sleeping Shake is sitting in the green chair with its back turned towards the TV and the Meatwad just on the ground sleeping next to him I don't know why Frylock is trying to explain this to Shake and Meatwad he should know by now that they're not going to give a fuck about this sciencey stuff and then eventually frolic is frustrated he just points out that he has a shrink ray and then shake takes some interest so the real question is how do we improve computer chip technology faced with microscopic size limitations and i know we've all asked ourselves that at one time or another right <laughs> shake meet what Hey! Huh. Shrink ray! You got shrink, shrink, shrink ray? We had to go through all that crap just so you could show us the shrink ray? Now what you're saying is interesting. Uh, okay, so I have to cut it off here because it's going to go on kind of a bit longer with a lot of visual elements. So really quickly, I want to talk about this whiteboard. I like how, of course, in typical Aqua Teen fashion, I really have to commend the artists who work on this show. It's all dingy. You know, it's got duct tape on it and it's just it's got cracks and and stains on it and, and all that stuff. So it seems like Frylock found this somewhere like in a dump stir or something however he does have a nice blue and red marker that seemed to work well and then a little eraser there too so uh in retrospect i have to think that maybe frylock is doing this presentation not for shake and meatwad but he's kind of practicing it for when he takes this to market and and maybe tries to find investors or whatever although of course like a shrink ray i don't think you need a pitch for that right it's like hey it's a shrink ray it shrinks stuff i think i think people would be on board immediately with that but to explain the shrink ray visually, it's kind of like almost a telescope, 
but with like more of like a gun part on it, I guess. Little handles, and you point it at things and can shrink it that way. It's on a little tripod. Not super descript, but of course, it's kind of a nice juxtaposition between Frylock's whiteboard, which is all shitty. This shrink ray is very slick, very high tech, very nice looking. I always wonder how Frylock makes this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I wish that they would show a little bit more of that because I'm really interested to see. Oh, I should also mention that Frylock at a certain point was pointing at the whiteboard with a stick, kind of like a presentation stick, although I suppose it could be a pool stick. I'm not really sure, but, you know, he pulls that out of his box, as as we've discussed. He keeps lots of stuff in there. I, I, I kind of want to take them and, and turn them upside down and shake them and, and see what falls out of there. So far on the show, I guess Shake is the only one who doesn't actually store stuff inside of himself. But okay, let's jump back in now. Shake, he's going to gain control of the shrink ray, and Miwad's just going to start pointing stuff out in the living room that Shake could shrink. Until they get to the TV, uh, Meatwad talks about, oh no, make it bigger, and Shake just knows how to do that somehow. He knows how to work this shrink ray perfectly, and after shrinking the TV really small, they make it huge. But uh, before the TV, they shrink the green chair, and they shrink their phone. It's right there. Whoa, uh, chair. Uh, it's right there. Wait a minute. Uh, just uh, right no, not that part. This right there. Make it a big screen. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a toy, Shake. You say that about everything you own. You should own toys. They're fun. So that is Frylock. He just grabs the shrink ray away. And now he's going to explain how, you know, it's not a toy. It's important. There are very crucial purposes that it can serve, not just fucking around and, and shrinking their chair and, and making their TV huge. I have to wonder, how does this shrink ray work? Like, what is its power source? Very interesting. It's not plugged into anything. But uh, as it's shrinking stuff, it just shoots out a kind of electrical beam that hits stuff and then shrinks it. But all right, to move on to our next clip, I should say here, this episode was kind of hard to cut up, especially in the beginning of the episode, because it's just very dialogue based. They're not changing locations. Uh, stuff is happening, but they're all just in the living room. So it was hard for me to cut up. So th this might be a little sloppy with the cuts. But basically, yeah, again, Frylock is going to explain how this isn't a toy. And then Shake and Meatwad are going to throw out some potential purposes for it. And then Meatwad, he's going he's to pull out a hot dog and say, hey, make this bigger, make this a foot long. And they'll kind of talk from here. But I want to point out now, listen to all of these suggestions because it's kind of cool. They do actually come true throughout the episode. Shake, this is an important scientific tool. I mean, surgery, space exploration. Can't you just see the applications? Yes. Make my Johnson bigger. <laughs> and make this a foot long. Hey, <laughs> and shoot us a pool in the back. The ray does not shoot pools. Then why are you wasting your time on it? You ought to invent like a pool shooting ray. Swimming. Doing the high dive. Marco Polo. <laughs> I mean, can't you see the applications? Give me some relish. Uh, mustard, too. I want me a yellow dog. No. <laughs> We're doing my Johnson first, and let me find some chicks and upgrade their butts. Because baby likes back. My anaconda dog. So that is Meatwad singing Baby Got Back there. And of course, when I heard that, you think Baby Got Back, but you also, there's that Nicki Minaj song that, like, sampled that or borrowed that or whatever. So you could you could hear both songs in, in what Meatwad is singing. But of course, when they made this episode, that Nicki Minaj song was not out yet. But all right, there's some sort of, I don't know if this is actually a visual gag or not, but when Meatwad has the hot dog, he's kind of shaking it in front of the camera, but where he's holding it, the perspective looks like it could almost be Shake's dick and he's like moving it around. I don't think that was intentional, but it did kind of catch me off guard here. But yeah, they, some of the things that they say that Frylock should do is make Shake's Johnson bigger, which of course they don't do to Shake, but Carl will do that at the end of the episode, spoiler alert. Uh, with the hot dog, we will see a giant hot dog later. And with the pool, Shake will do that with the pool later in the episode as well. So we'll point those out when we get to it. But I didn't catch that, you know, on, on my first viewing, of course. But it's kind of cool that all the things that they brought up actually end up happening to an extent. And we had some fun back and forth with Meatwad and Shake there. And that's something I like about this episode is they're kind of buddies in these scenes because they're both kind of uniting against Frylock being the serious guy. They're just kind of fucking with him. And Shake, I, I wish I could see the script here because some of the stuff he's saying, he's just kind of reacting to what Meatwad's saying to an extent. And I wonder if that's just Dana Snyder just ad-libbing. And of course, uh, in the commentary for this one, because again, every episode this season does have a commentary to some extent, again, those commentaries are, they, they do get very off topic because it was recorded at kind of a rap party. But in this commentary specifically, Dana Snyder does explain how they don't get the scripts until right before they record. And they typically don't even know what the episode's about. So they might be reading a line that's supposed to be sad, but not in a sad way. And then Dave will come in like, hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make that sound more sad or something like that. Because the guys just don't know. 
But also there's a big emphasis on how Matt and Dave and of course everyone that we've talked to on the podcast has verified this, that those guys, they are not afraid to just take better ideas and implement them into the episode. They're not super precious about their own ideas. So I kind of feel like Dana Snyder might, might have just been playing around with the script here and they just kept some of it. But you heard some rumbling at the end of the clip there. That was Frylock. He goes out of the room and he just leaves the shrink ray there, which is dumb to me. Like, why wouldn't Shake go and grab that instantly as soon as Frylock leaves? But that is Frylock leaving the room. Then he comes back with a giant microchip. And Frylock said, you know, surgery, space exploration, that's some of the uses the shrink ray could lead to. I assume by space exploration, he means in terms of like shrinking down these kind of microchips to build advanced technology to get to space and to explore it more effectively. So Frylock brings in the big microchip and then he shrinks it down to the size of a normal microchip, which of course, if this was real, that would be like substantially huge in terms of like developments because you'd be able to pack so much more processing power into these small chips. But Frylock, he picks up the tiny chip off the ground. Meatwad walks up, takes it and then eats it because he says it's a chip. And then he'll kind of insult Frylock. And then I love it because Shake will come in. He'll be all like, ooh like shake will just be really buddy buddy with meatwad here and then we will get some hip-hop music while frylock will pick up meatwad and kind of shake him and then throw him on the ground meatwad will splat we'll get kind of like a new meatwad drawing here of him splatted onto the ground My don't all right everyone just stand back and prepare to make history amazing do you realize that now this chip can be inserted into a microbot that could enter into someone's skin or through a pore? Or can be inserted into the mouth manually and digested so it can battle hunger and taste good. <laughs> Tell me you didn't just eat that hey, freaking- boy, you say it was a chip. So where's the dip? Or am I looking at him? Ooh, you did not even just do that. You are so dead. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh. So again, Meatwad getting splatted in a new drawing we have not seen yet. But Meatwad, very sassy here. He's insulting Frylock after just eating the microchip. And then, you know, he says, where's the dip or am I looking at him? Uh, he's, and he points at Frylock when he says that. And I think, you know, Meatwad, he's been playing too much insult master because he's acting a little too sassy here. And something that is, that is like shocking to me is that Frylock, he just let Meatwad take the chip out of his hand. Um... Why would he do that? It doesn't make any sense to me that he would allow for that to happen. Frylock is just acting all sorts of stupid in this episode with leaving the shrink ray unattended, uh, letting Meatwad take the chip out of his hands. Doesn't make any sense. Also, so Frylock says this chip can be inserted into a bot that can enter someone's skin through their pore. This chip is way too big for that to happen. Like, this chip is way larger than a human skin pore, so the bot that it would go in would then be even larger. We will get into that more throughout this episode because they, they act like things are smaller than they actually are, but I understand why they have to do that because for this chip to actually be small enough to be inserted into a bot that can be inserted into a pore, you wouldn't be able to see it on, like, your TV or on the screen or anything. It would just be, like, you wouldn't see it at all. So I get why they had to do it, but you can't help but notice these things. In the commentary here, we had some explanation on how this was actually a very technically difficult episode to make. And basically, back in, you know, 2004, whenever you did anything in After Effects regarding scaling, essentially it would cause a pixelated edge on the characters or whatever was being scaled. So because of that, they also had to blur, like the characters uh, we will get into later as they're being scaled around with, you had to blur these objects and also apply this warp effect to them. So they had to kind of do a lot of troubleshooting to get these, these things to shrink without looking just visually ugly because they would get all pixelated and, and just rugged and sharp when, when messing with them in this way. So just one of those kind of technical things they have to figure out while making the show. And of course, yeah, it's like you associate Aqua Team with being so simple, so cheap, but they really had so many issues they had to overcome to make it. And just a crew of super, super smart guys. I think some of the best in the business just based on hearing all these issues they had to deal with. People think this is like a, a stonery show. People will ask Matt and Dave and other people who worked on the show, like, oh, how, how high were you when you made this show? But they couldn't be because there was always so much stuff to deal with that it just wouldn't be possible. 
especially for how small the crew was that made Aqua Teen. I mean, compare it, for example, earlier in, in this night in the airing order, we had Futurama, and I'm comparing the, the cast and crew on this Aqua Teen episode to the Futurama episode, and I'm not going to go through and count everybody on this Futurama episode because it's so long, but I mean, it's not even comparable. This is like five, six, seven times longer than the Aqua Teen, uh, the, the Futurama one, that is. There's like seven times more people working on it than this episode of Aqua Teen. But okay, let's move on with our episode here. We now cut to the Aqua Teen's living room now. And uh, interestingly enough, it seems like their TV and stuff isn't even there anymore. Again, because they got to move stuff out of the way to, to make room for the staging that they need to do. So we have Meatwaddy's in the corner of the living room on a bucket. It's a dented up old bucket. And we have Frylock offering him a drink in a glass. And, and it's, uh, again, it's a glass so you can see through it. And it's like this, this kind of yellow... A mustardy looking mixture and Frylock will explain what it is. It sounds very disgusting. And the idea is to make Meatwad throw up the chip that he just swallowed. But, you know, Meatwad, he's a disgusting freak and he actually likes the drink and he just gulps it down like it's no big deal. All right, here you go. Drink this. Oh, I'm not thirsty. I said drink it. Well, what is it? It's mustard vinegar and oyster sauce. Oyster sauce? All right. Because you see that chip, it's coming out of you one way or another. A little tart, but you can fix that with a little half and half. But it was girl. So give me another. I get it now. He badmouths you, and you make him delicious sugary energy shakes. And I open my mouth in a helpful way, and I get slapped. Must be in Topsy Turvy World. That is Shake saying world there. Topsy Turvy World, not Topsy Turvy World. I just got to cut in here, let you know that Frylock, he's coming back with another glass. He says he may have peed in it. Who knows if he actually did or not. But Shake, you know, he's jealous that Meatwad is getting this special drink. So Shake, he's going to take it. He's going to drink it. And then he'll just start projectile vomiting everywhere all over the guys. They don't visually get vomit on them, uh, but we do see it on the wall behind them, on the floor. And Meatwad, he will hold up the bucket that he was sitting on to catch some of the puke, I guess, just to shield himself from it. And then we do get a nice little visual gag of after Shake is done throwing up, Meatwad puts the bucket down. We can now see it's filled with vomit. And then he'll just hop on it and continue to sit on it. Here's another. And I may have peed in this one. No way! Shake, wait! I am in training. Kind of fruity when you... Yeah! That was good! <coughs> My teeth feel gritty. And I'm going to lie down. Something I want to point out here, thanks to the Aqua Teen Hunger Force fandom wiki, was back in Interfection, Shake says that he doesn't have teeth, but then here he says his teeth feel gritty. But of course we know he has teeth because we can see that he has teeth when he talks sometimes. But I like the way that, you know, Shake, he tries to play it off as like he, he didn't just make a mistake. He's not going to admit, oh, I should not have drank that. He's going to say, oh, I mean, it was all right. And then he's going to go lay down in, in, uh, in Meatwad's room, of course. But during the vomit scene, we could see, we get like a wide shot of it, and you can kind of see where the effect ends on the ground, but I mean, it's not like I know how to fix that, but you, you can kind of see uh, this is an effect that was overlaid, and the vomit was actually done in Autodesk Combustion, which is an effects simulator, but I don't know if they're still making this necessarily. It looks like the last one was 2008 that they came out with the last Autodesk Combustion update, because, I mean, now there's, you know, a thousand 3D softwares and everything that you can that you can use instead. All right. Yeah. Looking more into it, it, I guess they didn't ever announce that it was ending. But the last update was 2008. And then around the same time, they started making a similar program called Autodesk Toxic. Autodesk being the company. So it was called Toxic. But now Autodesk, they make a, a, a program called Maya, which is their 3D animation software, which has all of these kind of abilities in it so they just kind of quietly stop working on these other things and and now you just got to use autodesk maya to to do this kind of stuff so i wonder if that's what they use on the show at this point i'm not really sure anyways to continue on with the gross out humor of this episode we have Meatwad again sitting on the bucket of shake's puke he will dip his hand into it and then kind of like lick the puke off his finger it becomes clear to frylock that Meatwad is not going to throw up he's not going to get his chip back that way so he's gonna have to wait till Meatwad poops it out but Meatwad will reveal that he does not emit waste, similar to the Plutonians. Oh, not bad. Scrape me some of that in a glass. A body needs nutrients. And I need that chip, Meatwad. One way or the other. Oh, okay, yeah. Fecal matter. Stool sign. Don't talk about it. Just do it. <laughs> well, I don't do it. 
My body consumes all waste material. It's like the Thunderdome in here. Only two men enter. No man leaves. <laughs> Rated R. No. Starring Mel Gibson, a uh, master blaster. Are you serious? <laughs> yep. You don't... Don't what? Uh... Come on. You... You know. Look, we're adults in here. You can say it. Uh, poop? <laughs> you said poop! Really quickly, I want to talk about the Mad Max reference here. We have Meatwad referencing the film Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, which is a fun time. I've seen it. I don't remember a ton, but but it was decent enough. But he says starring Mel Gibson, who is in Mad Max, but then he says, and Master Blaster. Master Blaster being a character, or rather a set of characters in Mad Max. Basically, Master Blaster, I guess it's kind of supposed to represent the inequality of, of physical and mental disabilities within the Mad Max world. The idea is there's basically this huge strong guy, but he has a mask on. It's almost like a cage on his head. So you don't actually see his face. And then riding him on his shoulders is a little person who is basically the master. And then the big, the big brawny guy is the blaster. So it's these, this kind of symbiotic relationship. You assume that uh, blaster, he has a mental deficiency, but then master, he is mentally there, but he has the physical disability. So they're kind of helping each other out here. So that's master blaster. And that is the, some of the references that Meatwad is making. Again, I, I love that he is referencing an actual actor in Mel Gibson. Of course, we've been talking about passion of the Christ recently. We have, the actual actor of Mel Gibson, but then also the fictional character of Master Blaster. Before I talk more about this clip, let me just bring you to the next very short clip because Meatwad and Frylock, they were talking about poop. Frylock said poop, and then Meatwad is going to yell to the other room where Shake is laying down, and he's going to tell Shake about it. Shake will start laughing, but then he will vomit, which will like projectile vomit to the ceiling, and then Shake will continue laughing while the vomit falls on his face. I said Poop. <laughs> Poop. Very, very gross. Lots of gross out humor in this episode. But to go back, you know, to the clip of Meatwad saying that he doesn't poop. First of all, you would think Frylock would know this. He would know if his roommate does not use the bathroom, especially, you know, the show is back and forth on if they have a bathroom or not, or, or exactly what the situation there is. You know, in Supercomputer, we see they have at least a shower somewhere that they don't really reference again. But then in another episode, Shake says that they use a pile of clothes in the hallway. And uh, again, you, you would think that uh, Frylock would know this, but regardless... Meatwad admits in the episode The that he does go to the bathroom. He says basically they had to eat Carl's prickle bushes and then Meatwad says, oh, that's why the bathroom hurts so bad. So uh, a little bit of inconsistency here uh, regarding some, some bodily functions of Meatwad. And if you are a new listener, of course I know this show is inconsistent. That's why I like talking about it. It's fun to spot these inconsistencies. And again, for, for Matt and Dave, above all else is the joke. They don't care about anything else but making the show funny. And in order to drive the plot along, Meatwad Wad, he can't go to the bathroom because otherwise the rest of the episode would just be waiting for Meatwad to go to the bathroom, which of course in itself could be kind of a funny episode. So since Meatwad won't go to the bathroom, he does offer up some really good advice to Frylock, which is, well, guess you got to shrink yourself down and inject yourself into me and then get your chip out that way. Look, here's the solution. You want your chip so damn bad? Shrink yourself down with your gun, come in here and get it. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's cute, Meatwad. But, uh, that would never work. Frylock says it will never work, but of course, because of the way this podcast works, we're missing the timing on this joke. Now we're going to cut right to the next scene where Frylock, he's in his bedroom and Shake has the shrink gun pointed at Frylock and Frylock's saying basically, yeah, shrink me down so I can inject myself into Meatwad and get the chip out. And then Meatwad, of course, will be like, well, that's what I told you to do. But uh, Frylock will pretend like it's not. Very surprising here. This is like really a Shake move where Shake will be like, well, no, I, I added a word to it. This is an original idea. But Frylock will be standing there with a syringe and he's telling Shake to shrink him down so that he can insert himself into the syringe to get into Meatwad's bloodstream. And then Shake will pretend like he doesn't know how to use the shrink ray, even though he was a fucking master at it the first time he ever saw it. But Meatwad will be in the room and then Shake will shrink Meatwad a little bit. And then the clip will end with Shake eventually shrinking Frylock down. Okay, Shake, shrink me down and inject me into Meatwad so I can get that chip. Good plan. How's that different from what I said? Because I said inject. <laughs> okay, which is the button? It's the red one. It's the only one on there. This one? Shake! Hey, Confirm for me. Uh, is this the button? <laughs> yes! I can stop. stop! Was that the one? Yes! Now stop uh. shrinking him, otherwise I can't get in there! Alright, crybaby. Tears can dry. 
But that was the button. Yes, ah! stop it, will you? So are we gonna go through this masquerade all day, or uh, are we gonna get down to business? Look, I'm ready. So kind of funny here because Frylock points out there's only one button on the shrink ray, but it doesn't explain, okay, well, how was Shake making things bigger than before? Like he made the, the TV huge. How did that work then? Doesn't really make any sense. But Frylock points out that because Shake was shrinking Meatwad, now it's harder to get into Meatwad. They're going to shrink Frylock down, but you'll see that he like still won't, he wouldn't even fit in this syringe. Like it doesn't make sense. And furthermore, if he could actually fit in the, I don't know, the, the plastic part of the syringe, there's no way he would fit through the needle. The needle is so tiny. Uh, uh, this just goes to the whole sizing discrepancy on this episode that Frylock would have to be shrunk down much, much smaller to actually go in this syringe than they actually shrink him down to. But Frylock doesn't say anything. He doesn't point it out. He doesn't say, hey, you still got to shrink me more. He's like, all right. I'm a good size. Now inject me into Meatwad. Like it doesn't, you know, it's like surely he would know that wouldn't work. Really quickly to let you know when Meatwad is shrinking, they say in the commentary that that was done by Nate Cherney. And Nate did visual effects in compositing on Aqua Teen starting in Video Ouija the previous episode. So yeah, they say that in the commentary. It's always nice to know who did which specific little bits in the episode. So whenever you see Meatwad shrink in there, you can thank Nate. Nate would go on to work on, of course, the Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters, but also every other episode of Aqua Teen, the Terror Phone series, and then he did some other Adult Swim stuff like Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, Squid Billies, Final Deployment 4, and Too Many Cooks. Unfortunately, though, Nate was not credited on Plantasm, so we'll see if he pops back up in future Aqua Teen content. And since we're talking about new visual artists on the show in Season 3 of Aqua Teen, I do want to shout out joining on in Video Ouija as well. We have Joshua Mullinax, Mullinax, not really sure how to pronounce this. If you're listening, Josh, I'm sorry. Josh actually reached out to me a little while ago saying if I ever wanted to talk Aqua Teen animation with him to let him know. And I certainly do. So I will definitely be reaching out to Josh soon. So expect to hear a fun interview about Aqua Teen animation. And if you have any Aqua Teen animation questions, send them my way and I'll ask Josh when I get to talk to him. And unlike Nate, Josh is also credited on the Aquadonk side pieces as well as Plantasm. So, okay, back to our episode here. In a classic Master Shake move, he shrunk Frylock down, but then he just picks up the shrink ray and goes to leave the room. He's not going to help Frylock with this. He just, he leaves Frylock defenseless. Frylock can't do anything about it because he's so tiny now. Let's hear it all play out. Okay, now put me in the syringe. <laughs> Say that again. That was awesome. Come on, I'm tired of messing around. Put me in there. <laughs> I wish you could hear how you sound. It's hysterical. <laughs> hey, hey, get back here. Where the hell are you going? Hey. I go where I want to, little man. So that is Shake slamming the door on Frylock. I mean, Frylock really can't get out. He's so tiny now. But again, you know, like I said, I, I don't want to talk about this too much going forward. But uh, Frylock, like he obviously he would see, oh, I'm too big to fit in that syringe. But maybe, you know, he's just so desperate to to get the chip from Meatwad, who again is smaller now. Meatwad isn't as small as Frylock is, but Meatwad is much smaller. So regardless, he would not fit in, in Meatwad really much better than he would before. Maybe a little bit better, but discrepancies aside, let's go on to something that is not a discrepancy. We're going to get a cool Schooly D cut, our first of the season, and we're going to see Shake outside, and he's bringing a tiny little thing. He's carrying it. You realize it's Carl's pool. He's shrunk down Carl's pool. Now he threw it in the Aqua Teen's front yard, and now he's going to use the shrink ray to make it huge. I guess, you know, of course, as we learn, the shrink ray can do that as well. He's going to make a giant pool in the front yard. So a callback to what he was saying earlier in the episode that he wanted Frylock to give them a big pool. Well, Shake, he's finally making it happen. Man, I don't understand a damn thing y'all doing. <laughs> Shake kind of running away from the pool because it's becoming so large. It's funny, you know, he throws it in the front yard and then he makes it so big that it, it starts to go into the street and you would assume it would eventually like hit the Aqua Teen's house. Now, Shake did say he wanted a pool in the backyard, 
but they did it in the front yard. And I think it's because up until this point, or, or, or even including this point, like in the show's run, we have not really seen the Aqua Teens backyard except for from Carl's backyard. Eventually, we will go to the Aqua Teens backyard, but they don't have that asset yet. So that's why they just default to the front of the Aqua Teens house and why it starts to like go in the street and everything. Really funny animation there, just seeing Shake kind of run away while he's holding the shrink ray, continuing to make the pool larger and larger. So we are now going to cut in on Frylock, and he's in a peculiar surrounding. It looks like he's in front of a mountain, some sort of forest area, but after 0 .001 second, you realize that it's all crudely drawn, and then eventually Carl drops in next to him. We pull out. We see we are in Frylock's room. Shake is there holding the shrink ray. He's put these guys in this little diorama that I assume that he made for this, and the idea is for Carl and Frylock to fight to the death, Carl will play along, he will quickly pick up a toothpick, and then he'll start to jab Frylock with it until Frylock will shoot fireballs out of his eyes and explode the toothpick. Of course, Carl, his tune will change very quickly. So enjoy this conversation between these two, and as you would expect, their voices are both high-pitched because they are smaller. Quick, grab a weapon and battle for the mountain! Damn it, Shake! You will call me king, slave. Now <laughs> fight for my amusement! Ow! How'd you like that tune-up? Carl, what are you doing? Stay down. Said if I won, he'd make my Johnson bigger. <laughs> I mean, it's already huge, but, uh, you know, never hurts to get, uh, extra credit. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, 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 Fryman. I give. He just started playing with my insecurities. Come on, Fryman, I'd never hurt you. I love the kind of call to Mad Max, the Thunderdome. I don't know if that was really intentional, but the Thunderdome is, you know, it's a fight to the death inside the Thunderdome. Here, Shake is having Carl and Frylock fight to the death in this little diorama. And I just love the visual of Shake putting this together. Like, he's doing arts and crafts before he <laughs> is going to make these guys fight to the death. I wish we could have seen some of that. Shake sitting at the table uh, coloring this little box here to, to have the guys fight inside of it. But continuing on here, you heard Carl. He's kind of like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But then Shake is going to make Carl bigger now, so he will be more physically powerful than Frylock. And then Carl's going to pick up a pen that's on the ground and then continue to jab at Frylock. Like, he becomes aggressive again now that he is larger than Frylock, now that Frylock does not pose a threat to him. Oh, no! Beware of the hairy giant! <laughs> Look, I'm sorry about this, Fryman, but it's you or me. Ah, and I keep getting these friggin' emails, these people. Come on, they know that I'm Carl. small down there. Will you listen to me? Yeah, listen to him. Isn't it funny how he talks? Hey, hang on. I'm going to make it even funnier. Hold on a minute. So before Shake makes it even funnier, I have to think, you know, Frylock, why is he here? He can fly. Why not just fly? You know, once Carl tries to hit you with the thing, just fly out of the box and he won't be able to hit you anymore. I really wonder why he's just staying on the ground there. But I love this drawing of Carl. It's a, it's a new drawing for this episode. I don't recall ever seeing this drawing of Carl in this kind of aggressive spear stance. So, you know, definitely check this one out for that new asset there. And we didn't talk about this, I don't think, in Video Ouija, but going between Aqua Teen seasons, I have to imagine that's when they would be cleared for a new budget. So it's interesting to see how they spend that budget here. And yeah, so far the visual effects are definitely way higher than we are used to on the show. With Video Ouija, of course, with a lot of lighting effects, I, I kind of touched on it there. But then here we have like the throw up, which is some sort of particle simulation. We have this new drawing of Carl. We have, you know, more new assets than we're really used to seeing in one episode of Aqua Teen. And of course, the episode is not over yet. We will continue to see more. So just, you know, I love keeping an eye on that between seasons. Like, all right, what new stuff are we getting this time? Because as you know, back in like the first season and, and a lot of the second season, they're just reusing what they already had. But okay, back to what Shake was doing to make things more funny. He's going to shrink Frylock down even smaller here. And then we will have Carl almost killing Frylock. We will, Frylock is kind of pinned to the ground. Carl has the pen up against Frylock's face. But eventually Frylock will talk Carl out of it. If we work together, we can defeat him. All right, we'll work a deal, but you got to promise me. You got to give me some action down here when we're done with this. <laughs> I mean, I'm freaking, you know, hung like a zoo animal, but I want more girth. So, of course, we had Carl, who was just saying that he is insecure about his penis size. His penis is small. But now suddenly he's like, oh, I'm hung like a zoo animal, but I, I want my dick to be thicker, not, not even necessarily longer. So back and forth here reminds me of the 
superhero episode where Shake is back and forth on, like, he says he's the Drizzle, but then he's like, oh, I'm not the Drizzle. Uh, just kind of classic Aqua Teen back and forth. And a, a very quick change of heart from Carl, how quickly he goes from almost killing Frylock to deciding not to. And if I could speak to this background again, I love it. It's just so artsy. It's just different art style than we're used to in Aqua Teen, because again, it's like this crude forest scene. And I've actually, uh, I've, I got uh, an Oculus Quest recently, and then I got this game called Vermilion. It's not really a game. It's just like a like painting software. So it kind of emulates oil painting, like the kind Bob Ross does. So when I when I see this, I'm kind of like, now I'm thinking about painting. I don't know how to paint, but I've been messing around in the software, making some cool stuff. And uh, maybe I, I kind of want to recreate this scene, maybe one day. That must have been fun for whoever made it for the show. Of like, all right, we need this kind of forest scene, this mountain, but it has to be crude. Like, it just would be so fun to make this thing that purposely needs to be crude and not have to worry about making it perfect or anything like that. It's, you know, a, a kid could have done this. And that is because in the episode, a child essentially did do it. Master Shake, I, I guess, did it. Of course, Meatwad could have had this from previous, but we've never seen Meatwad with this diorama. So let's continue on here with the episode and kind of finish out this scene. So brace yourself, there's about to be a hellstorm of orange drink. We have Shake standing above the diorama with a, a, a white cup filled with some sort of, you know, orange soda. He's going to spill this onto Carl and Frylock, and we get some really nice just effects of, of the, the particle effect of the, of the liquid, but also on the diorama, it becomes stained behind where, where Shake is pouring, which is just a really great effect here. However, that stain will quickly go away because Frylock will eventually shoot like a fireball out of his eyes at Shake and it hits the cup and we get like a, a pan out shot for that and we see that the diorama is no longer stained like in the far shot. I understand why because that would have essentially been like a whole new asset they'd have to do. But uh, yeah, we do see a little fireball on the cup Shake is holding, but all it does is leave a little black mark because again, Frylock is so tiny that his powers aren't really that great. And then that will kind of make Shake in a way angry and he will shrink Frylock until Frylock will just disappear. We won't even see him anymore. Oh no! A hailstorm of orange drink! Oh, come on, man! Fine, man, shoot this jacket. That's it, you just made your last mistake. Try this on for size. Oh, that's so cute. You want to compare rays, okay. <laughs> so Frylock is just gone. He He's so tiny that we don't even see him anymore. And we have Carl, he just kind of looks around and he's like, all right, well, are you going to hook me up here? But then Shake kind of changes the rules. He's like, oh, well, there's a new contender for the mountain. He's going to drop in a small meat wad who is really bigger than Carl with another toothpick now. And I want to point out here, the diorama is yet again stained with the orange drink while, again, in that far shot, we could see it was clean. But Carl will quickly just give up. He's like, all right, take it. It's, it's over there. He points at the mountain behind him. I want to mention we get, I, I think it's a new Carl drawing, but I'm not entirely sure of him looking up and talking. Like he's looking up in the air and talking. But it's possible it's not a new drawing, but I, I don't know when he would have previously been looking up and talking at somebody. But regardless, let's hear it play out. Okay, so, uh, hey! <laughs> I won, right? So, uh, you gonna hook me up here or, or what? You know, I need, uh, lengths or and girth. Both, preferably. I'll take one. Whatever. One more <laughs> contender in the battle for the mountain! <laughs> oh, friggin' take it. It's right over there. I like Carl. He's like, I don't care which one if you give me more length or girth. If he has a small penis and he got, like, really girthed up, I think that would just be, like, a weird chode or something. I don't know why he'd want that. Something I forgot to mention in the previous scene when Frylock is shrunk down is I did see that pixelated rough edge that they were talking about in the commentary, uh, if you really pay attention and, and look at it. Of course, if you were watching this back in 2004 on, like, a non-HD TV, you wouldn't notice this, but, you know, with, with modern technology, modern monitors now... We can see all the beautiful flaws and talk about them here. But okay, so after that, the scene just ends. We don't really see how it plays out. And then we see Shake. He is sleeping on the green chair in the living room. But the green chair is huge now, right? He turned it into like a deluxe edition. And then the TV, as we know, is still gigantic, even though previously it was not there. That's all right. 
completing our, you know, things that that Shake and Meatwad want at the beginning of the episode, we see there is a giant hot dog. It's just beautifully laid up against the chair. I love how it's how it's like modeled here, how it's posed. And there are just bite marks all over the hot dog. So instead of eating it like you would expect somebody to eat a hot dog, you know, like one piece at a time or whatever, he just like nibbled all over it. So it's like a full hot dog, but there are just bites taken out of it. I mean, if you've seen Radon, the, the Aqua Teen Hunger Force special feature, you will know the skin is the best part of the hot dog, so I guess that's what Shake was going for here. Shake is sleeping, eventually we hear Frylock, like his really high-pitched voice, and then we hear Carl as well, and Meatwad. Turns out they are in Shake's eye now, so we see them just kind of like floating in Shake's eyeball, but then we get some close-ups on the three, and they would be like the size where we would expect them to be in a normal episode of Aqua Teen, and when we get that close-up, the background is like we see just a really close-up of an eyeball, so there are like veins and everything like that inside of it, and... We can assume here that Shake, he just shrunk everybody down to be super tiny just so he wouldn't have to deal with them anymore. And that's important to remember for what's going to happen in this clip. Because what happens is Frylock and Meatwad, they will start to pull on Shake's, like, his nerves, and they can essentially control him. It's very outlandish, but I really like that they do that here. And they cause Shake to pick up a baseball bat and just start beating the shit out of himself, and he's all black and blue by the end of the clip. But Shake, he won't concede that they are doing this. He'll act like he wants to do this. But yeah, you might think everything that happens going forward is extreme. But I really do want to hammer home the point that Shake shrunk these guys down and left them to die, really. So, uh, you know, he kind of deserves it, I, I think. But I want to give you a content warning. Really, it's a cuteness warning because we will hear Meatwad's voice pitched very high up. And I guarantee it will be the cutest goddamn thing that you will hear today. Wake up, Shake. Shake. Wake up. Let me do it. Get up, you uh, freaking yeah. jerk off! Where, where are you? We all up in your brain, boy. Impossible. <laughs> I have no brain. Yeah, we noticed. So I just had to short circuit some nerves in here. We control you now. A uh, bull crap. Hey, buddy, you're about to see what I think is funny. Hey, pick up the baseball bat. No, 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 no! Why am I doing this? I'm dreaming! <laughs> well, let's just wake you up then, all right? Glad to oh. shine, buddy! You know, I'm doing this? Because I want to. I do it all the time! <laughs> when you're not around! Oh. Okay, I gotta hear that again. We all up in your brain, boy. Okay, one more time. We all up in your brain, boy. Dude, that is the cutest thing that has ever happened on this show. Uh, hands down, up until this point, easily. I wish we heard more of the high-pitched meatwad. Of course, we will hear a bit more, but not enough. But yeah, not much more to that scene than what I said, is he just starts beating the shit out of himself and acting like he wants to do it. So let me throw you another fact out that we learned in the commentary, and that is at this point in Aqua Teen's run, it would take about two days of work to do an entire episode's lip sync. Which, to me, lip sync work sounds like the most boring thing in existence, just having to, to match the mouths with the words. But, I mean, hey, I'd rather do that than my job. Something worth mentioning about this super large TV asset is that I think it's a new asset. Like, they didn't just take the image and scale it up. I think they actually remade this from the bottom up so that they could have it be giant and not just pixelated to hell. Because... Yeah, if they just try to take that and scale it up, it would just really be pixelated, and it does look a little bit different. Like The perspective on it looks a little bit different than how the TV normally looks. The chair, on the other hand, um, I mean, you know, they have what they have. It is scaled up, but it doesn't look that bad. I don't know how they did it. I don't think it's a new asset, but it doesn't look as pixelated as I would expect it to look. Moving on here, we're going to get a huge juxtaposition of extreme gore, but the cuteness of the high-pitched meatwad. He will be kind of swinging on and chewing on Shake's nerves, and he's going to cause Shake to pick up a chainsaw and cut his tongue off, which is as graphic as you can imagine. Okay, just the chainsaw. Okay, wait, we can discuss this. I don't think you can without your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Shake's tongue just spraying blood everywhere. And you know when there's a chainsaw, I gotta figure out which chainsaw it is. This is the chainsaw that we first saw in The Shaving. This would be the chainsaw that Willie Nelson, or one of them at least, that Willie Nelson would have been wielding to go scare Carl. But interestingly enough, in that episode, the chainsaws had to be plugged in. But in this episode, it's not the case. They are wireless now. 
But yes, this is not the same chainsaw we saw, for example, in Super Sirloin or in The Clowning. This is the shaving chainsaw, but a wireless version. So understandably, since Shake just cut his tongue off, he is really in a state of shock because he's all bruised and battered. He's, his face is all messed up now. His, his tongue is cut off. He has blood coming out of his mouth. He's basically catatonic at this point, just being controlled by Meatwad and Frylock. So Frylock's going to come in and tell Meatwad to get out of shake, get in front of the shrink ray so that Frylock can make Meatwad bigger so that Meatwad could do the same to the other guys. So we get a really cute animation of, of a little tiny Meatwad coming out of of uh, Shake's mouth running along the shrink ray and then eventually we'll get into a shtick of making Meatwad bigger oh a little bigger oh a little bigger you get the idea let's check it out <laughs> Meatwad hop up I'll increase you with the ray then you do us okay okay <laughs> Keep it coming need a little more no this is smaller Little more, little more, keep it coming. Ah, uh, whoa. There we go. <laughs> Give me another little bump. That's big enough. <laughs> now do us. Give me another little bump. I realized it would be kind of difficult. Like, if you weren't measuring yourself, how would you know when you are the right size, right? Like, uh, for us as humans, uh, you, you kind of know your height, so you could just go off of that. But with Meatwad, it's like, does he even know how tall he is? You just got to go until, until it feels right, I guess. I love that Meatwad, he wants another little bump. He's like, yeah, make, make me a little bit bigger. Why not? Back to the beginning of the clip, we had Meatwad kind of hanging on Shake's nerves, and I love the physics on the nerves, like they they sway realistically with Meatwad as he's kind of chewing on them. It's a really kind of cute scene, uh, again, uh, with the duality of uh, Shake being just this disgusting mess at this point. And then I just love seeing little tiny Meatwad running along there, it's very, very cute. Unfortunately though, as soon as Meatwad is his normal size, and he's supposed to, you know, make the other guys larger as well, he gets distracted. He sees the giant hot dog that he wanted in the beginning of the episode. I would suspect this is like a cold hot dog. You know, it's not even like a an actual warm hot dog. But yeah, he gets distracted by that. It's not a good thing. Hey, uh, y'all see this big old hot dog? Meat what? Damn, that's a big hot dog. Meat what? Hey, meat what? I get back here. Funny to see the staging on this, you know, because of how limited these characters are in terms of where they can be looking and such. Basically, when Meatwad is all excited, he's looking at the TV and then it, and it looks weird because they zoom in on Meatwad while he's talking about the big hot dog. You don't even see the hot dog in the frame anymore. It's just him looking at the TV, talking to the TV about the big hot dog. It's kind of strange. But again, I, I understand why that is. I've been sitting here trying to think, if I had this shrink ray, what would I either shrink or make bigger? It seems like people are more excited to make things bigger than to make things smaller. And I'm not really sure. Like, there's nothing that immediately pops out to me. I guess the one thing would just be food, right? You could just buy one steak and then make it bigger. And then there you go. Now you have like the size of two steaks. I think that would be the most practical use for me in my life. You know, I'm thinking like, oh, the TV, but of course I'm thinking too uh, realistically about things. I'm like, well, if you made your computer monitor bigger, let's say, I don't think the resolution would be better. It's, it'd be the same resolution, so it would just be blurry. It wouldn't really work like you would expect it to. If you made your house bigger, then things just wouldn't be the proportion that they're supposed to be, so that would be weird. And my Johnson is already one of the biggest in the world, so I don't know. I don't know what I would make bigger, what I would make smaller. I think I would just sell the shrink ray and just spend that sweet cash. So Meatwad got distracted with the giant hot dog, and now we cut to Meatwad sleeping on the green chair, similarly to Shake. And then we hear Frylock's voice, and Meatwad assumes that, oh, like, you're in my head, get out of my head. But really, Frylock, he's just normal size now, standing next to Meatwad. And then Meatwad's gonna point out the hot dog, and then <laughs> we get a great sound of and visual of Meatwad. He slaps the hot dog, solid meat. Meatwad. Wake up, Meatwad, wake up. Where's the buzzer? You in my, you in my brain? Get out of my brain! No, we're right here. Oh, good. Hey, you want you some hot dog? <laughs> we, we got plenty. Look at this. Solid <laughs> meat. Nice little uh, particle effect comes off the hot dog when Meatwad hits it. Something that I'm noticing now is when Shake was sleeping on the big chair, the TV was on, but it was a static image. So there was no in-universe TV show being played. I don't know what the situation was. Uh, maybe just because it was so big 
the cable line or whatever didn't fit it anymore and wouldn't work, which is, you know, a realistic thing kind of goes back to what I was saying about just making your TV bigger wouldn't work the way you would expect it to. Uh, but now, like ever since then, the TV has been off, which is strange. We never saw it get turned off, but at some point, I guess it did. So Meatwad is showing Frylock his solid meat. Over in Frylock's room, Carl's playing around with the shrink ray. Also at this point, just the growth ray. We have just a great pose on Carl here. He is kind of like hugging the shrink ray, but it's pointed directly at his dick and he has it like the, the tip of it in his pants, in his sweatpants. So we see it under his pants kind of in there, uh, pointed at his penis. He's finally about to make the Big Johnson come true. Hello, ladies. I'd like you to meet my little friend there, Goliath. We had to order <laughs> special elastic pants. For him on the internet. We will get back to the aftermath of this, although I do want to mention that Carl says, oh, I had to order special pants on the internet. Ooh, wow, the internet. You know, I remember my first few internet purchases were like kind of a big deal. It's like, oh, I can't find this thing in the store. I can't find this specific M83 CD at Best Buy. I got to order it on the internet. So crazy. But now it's like you just buy everything on it. Even you can just get your normal sweatpants on the internet. They don't have to be special elastic sweatpants anymore. And just a reminder of, you know, how not that long ago buying stuff online was kind of uh, something of an event. But now it's like, yeah, so what? You know, I buy most of my stuff on the internet. Who cares? So again, we'll come back and see the aftermath of what Carl's doing. We cut back from there to the living room where Frylock and Meatwad are talking. We get a clip of Shake in Meatwad's room and he's just laying there, but he's missing an eyeball. Turns out that Carl and Frylock had to blow out Shake's eye to get out. I don't really know why. Like, why was, why was Meatwad able to leave Shake no problem, but then Carl and Frylock had to blow out Shake's eye? Not really sure why that is, but yeah, we see... At this point, I think what is Shake's carcass? He has to be dead, right? From just all the blood loss. He's missing an eyeball. He's gone through so much trauma. I think he's just dead because there's flies buzzing all around him. So we see Shake's dead body in Meatwad's room. And then we will hear from the other room, Carl playing around with the shrink ray. And then Frylock and Meatwad will talk about it. In case you're wondering, we had to blow out one of Shake's eyeballs to get out. But we're okay now. No thanks to you. Where's Carl? Oh, yeah! Awesome! He's, uh, enhancing himself. Is he learning a second language? Meatwad, incredibly innocent here, thinking that Carl is learning a second language. I tried to learn a second language, uh, I guess twice at this point. I took Spanish in high school. I mean, that went about as well as you would expect it to. And then, in my mid-20s, I tried learning Japanese. And then, I can't remember why I stopped, because I was making a lot of progress. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of tragic. I feel like I could pick it back up, like, where I left off, though, and I... I, I've tried to a couple times. It's just hard to keep up with. I'd rather talk about Aqua Teen every week than than uh, do something silly like that. I mean, what would that gain me? Just the ability to communicate with a whole other you know group of people? Ah, who needs it? But all right, we're about to see Carl's enhancements now. And the staging on this is actually really brilliant because, I mean, you know, Carl, he's got a big Johnson now. And at first you don't see it. The first time you see him talking, you see him, he's, he's walking kind of weird. But that's all you really know. And then eventually we get a fuller shot, like a wider shot. And we see Carl standing in Frylock's doorway. And then just his his uh, sweatpants are just spread open, going in the direction that you would expect his penis to be going. So that is the, the reveal there. Very funny. Of course, we never actually see Carl's penis. So let's, let's listen in and, and hear the reactions or I guess lack thereof. Hey, you guys got a wheelbarrow in here or, uh, you know... Grocery cart or something? No, Carl, we don't. Anything with wheels? No, Carl. What, you telling me I gotta drag this friggin' thing across the lawn? <laughs> Call the neighbors. I want them to see this. <laughs> Carl kind of realizing that all that glitters is not gold. He's like, you know, he made his Johnson gigantic. It's what he wanted. And I guess he's still proud about it. He wants the neighbors to see, but he's kind of realizing the impracticality of it, of having this, this big thing he's got to carry around now. But Carl, he seemingly won't have this giant Johnson for long because out of nowhere, the the chair that Meatwad's sitting on, the hot dog, the TV, they all go back to normal size. And then also the chip inside of Meatwad goes back to normal size. So it's basically Meatwad in the shape of that giant computer chip that we saw earlier. And this really lends to the technical aspect because they have to, you know, bring these things back to their normal sizes. But like with the hot dog in particular... 
it moves fairly realistically. In fact, it even hits Meatwad while it's kind of shrinking and slaps Meatwad kind of kind of to the left. So there's a lot going on here that they spent a lot of time on, you can tell. But it's kind of funny because like the split second, like a frame before the chair goes back to normal and the hot dog goes back to normal, you can actually see for a split second that Meatwad suddenly is in front of those assets rather than, you know, how, how they were before. But anyways, to the staging again... So Carl was in Frylock's room with the shrink ray. We saw him in there with it. But then suddenly I noticed that it was outside the room. And that is to set up the next scene because like, it makes no sense why it would be outside of the room. But it has to be for the staging of the episode because everything starts to go back to normal. Carl, his Johnson is safe for now. Like I said, it's not going to last for long. We can see that the effects eventually wear off. But Frylock, he realizes that this this device is is a menace to society. Kind of weird. I feel like he's kind of he kind of jumps to uh, a decision here before actually thinking about it. I don't know why he does this, but he decides against Carl's wishes to destroy the shrink ray, and that's why it has to be outside the room now, so that Frylock can go from the living room just right over to the hallway and blow it up. <laughs> oh, oh my God! Oh um. I just got found out, sir. Oh, this friggin' ray is friggin' awesome. Hey, you think this works on boobs? Yeah, it probably would, but it must be destroyed. Oh, okay, Mr. Moral. Look, don't do that. I'll buy it from you. Come on, man. Oh, man, you blew it, dude. I would have given you like 15 bucks. You're stupid for a genius. So you heard a little bit of squeaking there at the end. We will get to that. But before that, I want to say Carl is not really phased by the fact that everything got back to its normal size. Perhaps he didn't see that. He didn't notice it because we see everything go back to its normal size. And then Carl's just like, oh, this thing is awesome. I guess it's kind of like Viagra, right? You can uh, expand your Johnson when you need it. Then it goes away. You don't need it anymore. Then you're, you're back to normal. So my mind immediately goes to it would have been funny if they played with the Aqua Teens and, and Carl being inside of Shake. And then going back to their normal size inside of him, of course, that's very grotesque and gruesome. But uh, I guess a few seasons from now, they would not shy away from something like that. But uh, I I guess it's uh, it's good they got out when they did, because things would have been pretty crazy if they did not. But let's investigate that squeaking noise. We're going to jump into our last clip of the episode. And what was happening was, of course, Carl, his jaunt is still big. His pants are still kind of pulled away from his belly. And then we see this this yellow kind of crab creature. It's very cartoony looking. It peeks out, it jumps out, and then like a whole army of them all start crawling out. And, and they're just kind of single file, or I guess double file, walking through the house. Meatwad comments on it. Again, he's still in his computer chip form because that chip went back to normal size inside of him. But there are also some crabs jumping on Frylock's bed we see in the background. They're kind of taking over the house here. And then Carl, at the end, he's going to pull out his shampoo called Pubic Pride. There's some subtext there, but it's so tiny I can't read it. But then the picture on the shampoo bottle is just, it's like the silhouette of a man. And then there's like a crosshairs over his genital area. So that is the ending joke of the episode. These crabs, they're taking over. What the, what the hell is that? Look, Frylock. Crabs. Boy, there's a lot of those. Well, look, they're harmless, all right? They so get near you, hit them with the shampoo. Some very fun crabs there. Of course, pubic crabs do not look like this, and I don't even mean, like, with the coloring and stuff, but just their body shape is different. I know they're related to lice, which I've talked about, I have experience with, uh, when my wife got it years ago when she was working at a, at a preschool. Um, but I haven't seen pubic crabs in person, but I looked up like their shape and stuff and yeah, some artistic liberties taken, but I think that's kind of like the joke, right? They're these cute yellow cartoony crabs. My initial thought when I saw these crabs is they almost look like they're from a different show and it's a possibility they are, but I doubt that they are, you know, at this point, Aqua Teen isn't really borrowing as much from Hanna-Barbera content, but again, it is a possibility. I'm not really sure. And something I forgot to mention is that... Throughout the episode, when the shrink ray is pointed at something and it affects it by either shrinking it or making it larger, it does the entire thing. But then suddenly Carl's able to specifically make his Johnson bigger. It doesn't really make sense, right? You think his entire body would get bigger because that's how the shrink ray has worked the entire episode. But uh, it's Aqua Teen. What can you expect? But yeah, that is Unremarkable Voyage. Before I give you my thoughts on this one, let's jump into the discussion that was being had the, the week that it aired. And let me tell you, there's a lot of discussion. 
As you know, every week at the end of this podcast, we jump over to the Anime Superhero Forum that used to be called the Toon Zone Forum. And I've seen a lot of these. I don't remember exactly when we started looking at these, but I've seen a lot. And this episode is easily, up until this point, the most divisive and seemingly unliked episode of the show. Typically, most people are on board with it, and you'll see a couple people like, yeah, I wasn't really into it. But this one is really split almost down the middle of people who liked it or just didn't care for it or some even really disliked it eddie g says ha 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 all those with uh periods at the end crotch related anyway this episode was a little meh for me wasn't horrible frankly i didn't find the punchline about the crabs funny at all and honestly i think they went too far with carl elongating himself they should have stopped with the wheelbarrow joke other than that i found some funny moments but some just plain gross out moments Carl's fighting Frylock was okay, and the opening was okay too, but I think I missed the doc, meaning Dr. Weird. B-, minus. and that's again a thing too, is a lot of people don't really care for the Space Cataz intro. Of course, information was out that these were going to be the intros for the season, but not everybody knew that, so a lot of people are like, oh wow, we're still doing the Space Cataz thing. User Delthair said, that blue, that's the title on this one. Unremarkable Voyage left a bad taste in my mouth. An edge of disgust has always been a part of Aqua Teen Hunger Force, but it's traditionally been applied with greater care and judiciousness. Tonight, it was pure, inane shock. I suppose that criticism may be on shaky ground, but I stand by my right to not like this episode. The actual visual rendering of Carl's enhancement was something I could have done without and rather disliked. Couple that with a dearth of strong gags, and I think I have found what shall, I hope, be my least favorite episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Delthair then goes on to give the episode one star out of five. So this guy really did not like this episode. I, for one, didn't find the visual rendering of Carl's penis to be like that shocking or anything because you don't see it. I think it's actually funny the way they handle it. You don't actually see the full thing because he's half standing in Frylock's room. So it's behind a wall. You just kind of see the beginning of where his pants are kind of pushed out. So I think they did that well. But yeah, Delthair was not for it. User Ju Kuchi asks, is Master Shake going to be the new Kenny? Which is true, you know, because in this episode, the previous episode, Master Shake has died so, uh, in both episodes this season. And he died a lot towards the end of, of season two as well. So I definitely see where they are coming from with this. User DSR Girl has something interesting to say. Uh, they say, I have a feeling the writers, Matt and Dave, probably wanted this to be a super gross out episode. Hell, Adult Swim even warned us about it. It was still funny. I mean, looking past the barf, the incredibly in-your-face innuendo, the violence, etc., it was a pretty good episode. Not a personal favorite, but pretty good. So, DSR Girl is alluding to, I guess, Adult Swim warned people ahead of time, maybe, like, oh, this is a crazy episode of Aqua Teen. And yeah, they were right, because so far this is definitely the the most uh, gross-out, violent episode of the show that we've seen. Okay, I looked it up now. I actually found these bumps. I, I can't see how it started. Um, I assume it starts with them saying like, oh, there's a new Aqua Teen episode tonight. And then, so this is where I could actually read the bump now. It says, like we think they turned it in on Friday new. It's called Unremarkable Voyage. But Dave calls it the penis joke episode. Sorry, Mrs. Willis, if you're watching. Dave has a point though. Get it? Point? Not you, Mrs. Willis. The viewers. Anyway, there are a few below-the-belt jokes. Not to mention an STD and at least four alien butts. Unremarkable voyage. So those were the bumps, and I know reading bumps is kind of weird, especially when they're longer like that. And they do reference the space catas. Of course, we did not talk about it, but that involves the Moonanites and Plutonians mooning each other. Let's move on with our comments here. User Space Kitty liked this one. They say, one of the best episodes yet. Carl was on, that's in in caps, in every scene. Finally, Shake gets the complete living crap beat out of him. The only thing that sucked was Space Kataz. That rivalry got old real quick. So Space Kitty digging this one. I wanted to give you a a positive one in here. Some people did really like this one, and and maybe you do too. So the last comment I want to read you is from user Scythe Mantis. And they say, a fairly funny episode. Dead and beaten Shake was great. I was really expecting Frylock to go inside Meatwad for a while there, though. You just know they'd come up with something totally bizarre to be inside him, like a lost civilization or some freaky new villain. 
So from there, I want to go on to my thoughts because I completely agree with this. I would have loved to have seen Frylock and Shake having to get in a submarine, get shrunk down and go into Meatwad's body and, and watching them kind of argue with each other. And then maybe you have Meatwad in the overworld doing stuff that's causing them to have issues inside of Meatwad. And, and yeah, there could be like uh, some villain there that's really crazy. Just so many opportunities here. But instead, uh, I'm going to tell you now, I was kind of underwhelmed by this episode. Nothing particularly happens in it, it felt like. So I would have loved to have seen something like that. Now, I know that's like an entirely different episode, so it's not really great feedback on the episode. Plus, something like I described would have been way more expensive than this episode was, I'm sure. But those are just some of the things that while watching it, I was like, oh, that'd be cool if they actually did go inside Meatwad or or just something else. Because, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there just weren't a ton of jokes here that really got to me. And, and you could hear that throughout the podcast episode. I didn't laugh that much, especially compared to last week's episode, Video Ouija, where I was dying the entire time. Almost every line had me cracking up. Here, all my watch throughs of this episode is just like, you know, it's enjoyable. It's not like I, I think it sucks or it's bad or anything like that, but it's just like, okay, like that's fine. It's, you know, I, I honestly, I'd rather watch any other Aqua Teen episode. So because of that, I think I have to give this one one and a half dioramas out of five, which seems harsh, but that's a relative ranking to all the Aqua Teen episodes we've covered so far. Not a horrible episode. It's not like, oh, this sucks again. It's just, I don't know. It didn't really do anything for me. I, I hope it did something for you. I hope you like this one, but I have to wonder how much pushback they got from standards and practices here, because obviously we saw a lot of gross out humor and shock humor. But I wonder if they wanted to do more and that was supposed to make the episode better, maybe? Because for me, I, I've mentioned on this podcast before, the shock humor and stuff doesn't do a whole lot to me. I, I'm here more for like the random Dada humor that the show has. So I don't know. This one just didn't work for me. Again, I hope it worked for you. But uh, again, it, it, you, you might have noticed while listening, I, I wasn't really laughing as much as usual through it. And, and that's kind of all it comes down to. I'm here to laugh at Aqua Teen. Now, to this episode's credit, again, the technical aspects are amazing. But of course, we're not here to watch Aqua Teen for technical aspects. We're here to laugh. And uh, if it ain't making me laugh, baby, it ain't getting a high score. So I also want to shout out the cute meat wad. That was obviously a highlight for me of the episode. And anytime Shake gets his comeuppance, well, I'm not mad about it. So yeah, that's Unremarkable Voyage. I guess there's a reason that I didn't really remember this one too much because I guess I never just went back to it after seeing it once way in the past. But that's okay. They can't all be home runs. And I know there are a lot of great episodes coming up this season that I'm so excited to get into. And you know what I'm realizing now is the funniest thing. The second episode of every season I have not liked so far. Season one, I thought that Escape from Leprocopolis was one of the worst episodes. Season two, I did not like Superhero that much. And then now season three, Unremarkable Voyage, I was not crazy about either. So it's just the second episode slump here. It's not a big deal. So that is it for me this week. Thanks for hanging out, talking teens with me. Of course, if you value this podcast, if you, if you like having uh, this crazy Aqua Teen podcast that dives into the show, then please consider either supporting the show on patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden or just sharing the show, posting about the show, helping more people know about it. Both are very important. Also, I got to say thank you to everybody who has used the affiliate links in the show notes because that does add up. I'm actually surprised how much money I've stolen from Amazon because of you guys uh, for buying like Plantasm and the Baffler Meal Box set with those links in the show notes. Of course, you don't pay anything extra. It's the same Amazon price that you would pay without the affiliate link. So thank you guys for that. Thank you, everybody who supports the show. And again, thank you for listening. Even when these Aqua Teen episodes aren't really ones that I'm crazy about, it's still really fun to dive into them. It's fun to learn more about how the show is made and just to, you know, see where the show will continue to go. So before I let you go, I got to give a shout out to the homies, the number one in the Hood G tier patrons, Sean, Ian, Captain Buford, Brian, Robison, and Reverend Raven 46. You guys can borrow my shrink ray any day of the week. I'll see you next week for our fun Patreon preview. Again, if you are a patron, then uh, you'll get the full episode over on the Patreon feed. And then at the beginning of February, we're kicking off talking about Moon and Nights 3 Remooned. I'll see you then. Take it easy. Keep it cool. Bye-bye.